So this is a paper exercise. He's climbing library shelves rather than climbing mountains. Oh, absolutely. It was maps, imperfect as they were, and documents, or word of mouth, not mountains, that were the raw information Munro had first turned to. It is, it is, yes. His great work had begun indoors. And he's, he's annotated it in his own hand. Yes, he has. Yes. So this book is the first attempt anybody had ever made to list all the 3,000-foot mountains in Scotland. So it's the holy grail for people who love Scottish mountains. Indeed. He must have been a keen mountaineer already. Oh, he was. He was a keen mountaineer. Uh, we have uh, here his, uh, his application form to join the mountaineering club. Uh, mountain after mountain, yes. His early days climbing in the Alps, beginning in 1873. Yeah, I and mean, he's climbed the Wetterhorn, the Zugspitz. That's a, these are pretty serious mountains. Uh, Monte Rosa. Monte Rosa, yes, exactly. I tried to climb that once and didn't get to the top. Yes, well, it's, these, it's these high. Are, <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> so he's a great mountaineer. He was clearly dedicated to, to, uh, to, to, to keeping records. He was very good at doing that. Yes. Um, why was he temperamentally suited to this great work? We know that he was a stickler for correctness because uh, in, this is the second volume of the club's journal and in the, uh, right at the end of this volume we have a contribution from Monroe. Oh yes, additions, corrections additions, and remarks. Additions, corrections and remarks. By Hugh T. Monroe. <laughs> For wreck, read rock. He's, he's correcting other people's work. He's correcting other people's <laughs> mistakes. It's a bit of a nitpicker, wasn't a it? A bit of a nitpicker, <laughs> yes, yes. Meticulous attention to detail was precisely what the huge task of cataloguing Scotland's mountains demanded. When Munro started compiling the information he needed from maps, notes and word of mouth, he worked methodically and he worked fast. In September 1891, at the end of less than a year's work, Munro's list was finally published for all to see. Munro's results were astonishing. Until then, the true scale of the Scottish mountains had been something of a mystery. Some reckoned the total number of peaks exceeding 3,000 feet might be as few as 30. The number of peaks exceeding 3,000 feet identified by Munro was 538. For even the most knowledgeable of his mountaineering colleagues, the list was a revelation. The first ever comprehensive source of information about the peaks in their own backyard. They'd read about the Alps and the Himalayas. Some had even climbed there. Now, they felt Munro's list had laid bare for the first time the secrets of Scotland's landscape. But Munro himself was far from happy. The list did not satisfy his desire for precision. The information he'd been working from hadn't allowed him to say with complete confidence which mountains were above 3,000 feet and how many there were. Most peaks in Scotland had not been measured with any accuracy. At best, their heights were rough approximations. So here is Munro, an absolute stickler for rigour and order, putting his name to this list, yet knowing from the outset that it was riddled with uncertainties. A mountaineer of Munro's honour had to personally vouch for the information, and that meant he had to find some way of checking the heights of the mountains on his list. It would turn out to be the greatest task of his life. It's fascinating to me that what began as an obscure clerical exercise would grow into a modern phenomenon, Munro bagging the systematic climbing of the mountains in Scotland over 3,000 feet. But I've never really understood why people choose to climb hills just because they're on Munro's list. Glencoe's Clackig Inn is one place I might find answers. It's within spitting distance of over 10 Munro's and has always been a favourite watering hole for Scotland's mountaineers, even in Munro's day. You know, one of the things about the Monroes and about the Monroe list is that you get to go all over this wonderful country. 
and you get to see places that you would never otherwise see. I think Scotland's so big that it would be a structuralist way to climb hills if you just tried to you know, pick whichever one suited your mood at the time. I think having that, that list there to kind of work your way through gives you some idea of progress and some sense of purpose. And uh, what, what are the pleasures of going up the Scottish mountains? Not today, absolutely none, because it was miserable. You work all week, you've only got the weekend to, to climb mountains, and uh, somebody's luckily written a book, and you can go and do it without doing a lot of uh, preparation. What's the point in going up there if you don't get to the top? <laughs> it doesn't matter how tired you are, you've got to get to the top. So you started doing them, and now Claire, you suddenly found yourself doing them because you hooked up with Mark. Yeah. You're catching I'm only up. on about five or six at the moment. Claire likes lists. One thing that, that you really like is. Are you a list going, person? That's yeah. right, so I'm like ticking them off. Yeah. 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 Dedicated? Definitely. Slightly crazy? Perhaps. Munro, in 1891, was off to revise his list. And for that, he needed reliable figures for the heights of his mountains. Some Scottish peaks had been measured accurately by the Ordnance Survey, but most had not, because surveying demanded vast manpower, heavy equipment, and time. A single mountain could take days to measure precisely. Munro needed a simpler, faster method. Mountaineer Graham Little from the Ordnance Survey knows all about it. Munro is one man working on his own. It would have taken many lifetimes to survey the mountains in the way that the mm. Ordnance Survey mm. were. So what was Munro's solution? What was the answer? Well, he had a very simple solution. He uh, used a barometer. It's like a beautiful little pocket it? watch, yeah. isn't it? It's well, lovely. It yeah. is, and it, it, it measures uh, air pressure. As you gain altitude, um, air air pressure drops and so you can calibrate the barometer to read height. So the, the calibrations around yeah. the outside yeah. give you height above sea level? Absolutely, it gives you a pretty good result, yeah. But this device can't be used by standing at the bottom of a mountain looking upwards, can it? It does involve climbing every hill. <laughs> and looking around here and you see how many mountains there are here, we're talking about an enormous challenge. An enormous challenge, yeah. Epic feat of mountaineering. Absolutely. I'm sure he enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah. With only a handful of mountains having been measured accurately by the Ordnance Survey, for the rest, Munro is going to have to do the next best thing. Take his own measurements with his own barometer. To do that, each would have to be climbed. It planted the seed of an audacious notion that a single individual could climb all Scotland's 3,000-foot peaks. This was an idea that grew to proportions Munro could scarcely have imagined. It shifted the way these mountains are regarded. Their wilderness could be tamed. Standing here with my barometer surrounded by these wild mountains, I'm just beginning to sense how excited Munro must have been at the start of his incredible adventure. He had a lot to deal with. The measuring, the terrain, everything from bogs to narrow mountain ridges, the weather. These mountains can get so windy, you sometimes you have to crawl on all fours to reach the summit. And then, of course, the navigation, the thick mist. But these are just practical difficulties, adversities you'd have to deal with every day. There was something much bigger going on. He was setting out to be the first person to climb every 3,000-foot mountain in Scotland. And being first, if you manage to do it, is something you can carry in your back pocket for the rest of your life. And I'd love to have been in his boots. Munro was a bit of a loner. He climbed most of his mountains on his own. It was a solitary endeavour, and I do understand the attraction of that. You trade companionship for complete freedom of movement, and that's a good trade. I really have to marvel at the sheer ambition of Munro embarking on that journey in that age. And I'm a little envious too. His was the privilege of being the first person to set out to explore Scotland's mountains on such 